tonight I want to talk to you about dignity, self-worth, self-esteem, things we all have issues with. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to keep it super real with you. That's what I do with all of my talks. I don't feel like it's prudent or um, Christian to give a talk and not be vulnerable and honest because our Lord was. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to start with a question. Actually, I have two questions for you. You have a post-it in front of you and a pen. Um, and I want you to be honest and take a second. This isn't something you have to share with anyone else or talk to anyone else about. Um, on the right side of the post-it, not the sticky side, the correct side of the post-it, um, I want you to answer this first question, and you're just going to write yes or no. And there's no in-between, it's just yes or no. I want you to ask yourself, do I like myself? Do I like myself? And be honest. And not in a conceited, I think I'm dope, <laughs> right? Like not in that kind of way, just do I like myself? Do I like my attitude? Do I like how I look? Do I like how I talk to people? Um, do I like where I'm at in life? Do I, do I approve of myself? Am I confident in who I am and who God made me to be? Do I like myself? And then once you answer that, flip your post-it over to the sticky side. I want you to answer the question, do I love myself? Do I treat myself well? You know, Jesus, Jesus tells us to turn the other cheek, but he never says our head has to be down when we do it. When Pilate was questioning him, when Herod was questioning him, he didn't answer. It wasn't because he was insecure or didn't have the answer. He had dignity in his calling, and he knew who his father was. Amen? Amen? And so when I ask you, do you love yourself? I'm not saying, do you think you're better than other people? Do you like your muscles? You know, do you like how you look in jeans? That's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking you, do you love the inside of who you are? When you look at yourself, do you see Christ? Or at least who Christ made you to be? That's when you answer that question, that's what you're answering. And then when you're done, just fold that up. And if you all could just put them on this table. Have any of you ever asked yourself that question before? Before today? Yeah. Yeah, hands raised if you have. I'm asking you this because as the Pharisees and as the Jews and as even his own disciples were asking Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Like, how do we know we're following you? How do we know we're doing God's will? And he told them, well, you answer me. What is the greatest commandment? And they, re they responded to him. And they said the greatest commandment is that we love God. With all of who we are, with all of our soul, with all of our might, with all of our mind, and our flesh, and everything that we are, that we would love God. And he said, and I give you a new command. And his command was that we would love him and love everyone else as ourselves. You read the scripture, right? And when you read that scripture, the first thing that comes to my mind is, okay, I do love God. Right? We can all answer that. I love God. Do you love God? Yeah, so we can all say yes to that. But the second part is like, well, love my neighbor as I love myself. How well do I love myself? When people talk down to me, do I believe them? When someone tells me I'm worthless and I'm never going to amount to anything, or I'm ugly or stupid or fat or don't fit in, or do I believe them? Do I love myself? Or can I let the opinions of humans slip by? They may say whatever they want to say, but do I believe them? Do I actually love myself enough to say, well, that that's their opinion? I think I'm great. You know? I think I look good. I could work on some stuff. You know? I could hit the gym a little more. <laughs> right? I could eat a little better. But I don't believe it. How well do you love yourself? And in turn, if you don't, then what are you pouring out of to love other humans? Is the cup empty? I sat with this for about a year. That's how long it took me. So I don't expect any brilliant revelation tonight. But sit with these questions and really take them with you to adoration because Christ is asking us something very specific. I want you to love me and I want you to love everyone else as you love yourself. 
But if you don't love yourself, what cup are you pouring out of? If any time someone comes to you and they need you, but your cup is always empty, then it's always me, 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 and never them, them, them. Right? Christ was able to serve because his cup was full in his Father. But if our cup is not full in Christ and we don't know who we are, and we don't accept our, our identity in Christ, how can I even begin to love you? I don't even know how to love myself. I don't even know who I am. Right? So people get in relationships and they're like, oh, I don't know what's happening, and I don't know why we can't communicate, and I don't know why this isn't working. Half the time, these two individuals who are trying to make something work don't even know themselves enough to love the other person. Love is sacrificial. How can you sacrifice when you don't even know love from the inside of you? What are you sacrificing out of? Amen? Does that make sense? It's a very deep question. Christ doesn't say things that are empty and, and, and have no purpose and are void of meaning. He's asking us, do you love who I created you to be? In the very, very first chapter of Scripture, in the very first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, in the very first chapter of Genesis, he says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Let us make man in our image and our likeness. Male and female, he created them. And he says, let us. Who is us? Who's us? Who's he talking about? The Trinity. The Trinity. Let us make, good job, let us make a man in our image and likeness. In the image of the Father, in the image of the Son, in the image of the Holy Spirit, which is the love between them, and in the likeness of the Father, in the likeness of the Son, and in the likeness of love, who is the Holy Spirit between them. That is who you are created to be. Now, believing it and hearing it are two very different things. You can hear it and say, oh yeah, I know I'm made in God's image and likeness. I don't like bugs. That's just like a total sign. Of so you, you see that land on me? Just please come get it. <laughs> it's less embarrassing if you get that. <laughs> but how, how? I literally spent months sitting in this church in adoration, in daily mass, and saying, Lord, help me to see myself as you see me. You see, if you've ever experienced rejection, how many of you have experienced rejection in your life? Job, humans, family, whoever, amen. Okay, so if you've ever experienced rejection, the first thing that happens is you have two choices. You either believe the person who rejected you is right, right? So if they said, um, I don't like you because you're A, B, C, and D, you start to believe A, B, C, and D. Oh, man, maybe I am like that. Or you're super prideful and you're like, I'm not like that. Forget them. I don't need them. Take them to the curb, right? So you either you have one of two extremes. You have one of two extremes. You either kick them back when they kicked you, or you believe what they said. And if you're the type of person that believes what they said, you start walking with a handicap. You start believing what that person said about you versus what God said about you. Does that make sense? He's calling you to be him on this earth. And that is not a small task. He's saying, I made you to look like me. In my likeness, which is pure good, which is pure love. I am goodness. I am love. That's who I am. I am justice. I am mercy. And I made you to be good, to be justice, to be mercy, as I am those things. In my image and likeness, you are my child. And I gave you identity when I breathed life into your soul, that you would be in your mother's womb and be created. Your life is not purposeless. It's not meaningless. You are put here at this time, in this place, to show other people who God is and who you serve and who it is that you profess you believe. So we go to Mass, and we sit in Mass, and we recite all the words back to the priest that we're supposed to recite during the Mass. But do we believe them? When we leave those doors, do people even know what a Catholic looks like? Do people see Jesus when they look at us? Who do we serve? The world? Ourselves? Him. What does that look like? Have you met someone that you go, man, that person reminds me of Jesus? <laughs> I mean, have you? That's a really honest question. I ask myself all the time, like, who looks like Jesus in my life? There has to be somebody. Right? And the first person that comes to mind for me is my mom. She is a suffering servant. Anyone else, like, the first person in your mind is your mom or your grandma? 
right? Or maybe your dad, maybe your grandfather, I don't know. But like, the first person that comes to mind is my mom, the suffering servant. She is more than willing to put herself on the line for anyone else, anyone else, without a question, without a doubt. She's the first person when something is done unjustly to say, this is wrong and it needs to stop. And this is the path we are to take in righteousness and truth. It's not a, just sit over there and just don't care and just sit in the corner and put your head down. That's not our faith. Our faith is one that stands on justice and mercy. Right? Our identity is found in both justice and mercy because that's who God is. Our faith is also one that is found in goodness, truth, and love. Lies have no place in us. Amen? God is not a lie. God is truth. And so in us has to be, especially as Catholics when we receive the Eucharist, right, in a state of grace, we now carry him and his spirit in body, spirit, soul, divinity, all of him is now within us. So when we go out into the world, that's our identity. They should say, oh, those are Christians. Those are Christians. They're a little weird. They bow before a piece of bread. And then, oh, wait, somebody told me it's not a piece of bread. They believe that's Jesus. Jesus? Jesus is bread? People should question the stuff Catholics do. It should make them go, why did they do that? We should be so um, fervent in our identity as Christians that people look at us and say, there's something real weird about those people, but I tell you what, one day I really needed somebody, and they were there. And you know what? I yelled at them one time, and they showed me nothing but love. They showed me nothing but love. They returned my bad behavior with good behavior. That's our identity. That's who we are in Christ. And as you read through the Gospels, and as you read through the New Testament, that's all St. Paul continues to say over and over and over again. He talks about who we are in Christ and the faith we have to have in order to become that in Christ. He says we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, which means when we receive him in the Eucharist, that's his righteousness dwelling inside of us. So when you think that what that person told you a long time ago, that you're no good and you'll never amount to anything and you're ugly and you're fat and you're stupid, you're too skinny, you're too small, whatever they said to you, when you can hear those words and remember, when I received Jesus, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am no longer what they say I am. I am who he says I am. Amen? That's a very big difference. We can go around the world wounded and hurt from what people have said and what people have spoken about us and carry those wounds with us. How many of you have done that? Believed the lie for a really long time. Like, yeah, they're probably right. Something's wrong with me. I don't know why I act like this. Blah, 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 blah. Have a pity party everywhere you go. Instead of, my identity is found in the cross. And maybe I used to be that way, but I don't have to be that way today. Amen? The sacrament of confession frees us. It heals us. I can't tell you how many days in a week I have gone to confession over the smallest things. Father Obu was here, he'd be like, yep. <laughs> no, he's not supposed to say that, but he probably like, mm. <laughs> Make the Father Obu face. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm not sure if this is a sin, but bless me, Father, here we go. Right? Because, because I'm striving after the heart of Christ. I wanted to make my heart pure. Right? How can I act like him, walk like him, fully be in the identity of Christ if I have all these sins all over my heart that can't even, he can't even access, the grace can't access to heal, right? To fix, to bandage up the wounds from people's words that I accepted for the longest amount of time. How can he get in there if I don't let him? That's why we have the sacrament of confession. It's to reunite us to God. So that we can be who he calls us to be on this earth. So that when we walk around, people say, oh, those are Christians. Or they might say, oh, those are Christians. Or, oh, those are Christians. Either way, they still see us, amen? <laughs> What's worse, for them to see us and roll their eyes? At least they know we're Christians. Or for them to walk by and not even know, oh, they're probably atheists, they'll come with us. <laughs> right? We're in the world, none of it. Or maybe we are in the world, none of it. That's between you and God. I don't know your life. Big difference. Big difference. And in a world, especially in this generation, that wants to tell us who we are, what we can and can't be, 
he continues to reaffirm for us who we are and whose we are and who we belong to. In such an affirmative, powerful, encouraging, you can't tell you how many times St. Paul says, encourage one another, encourage one another, encourage one another. I never once read St. Paul say, condemn one another. You know what, you should just walk around beating each other over the head with bats until they get it. Never once. He continues, he continues to the last day saying, encourage one another, uplift one another, love one another, serve one another. That is his constant admonition to us. Learn how to love. He says, I spent three years he spent three years before he was allowed to start his ministry, after he went blind and Ananias came and he, Ananias came and prayed over him and the healing from the Holy Spirit came and then he got baptized and then all of a sudden Paul was like, I need to go away for three years. Why? So I can learn how to pray, I can learn how to speak, and most importantly, I can learn how to love. Do you know we have to learn how to love? Like, if you think you know how to love today, wait and watch what happens as you continue on your Catholic journey. Three years from now, you should look different from how you look today. If you're doing this right, you should be a new creation, constantly. Our journey with the Lord isn't like, God confirmed, I'm set, I'm heaven bound. <laughs> right? It's not like that at all. Boom, I got baptized, saved, heart, check, done. <laughs> I can go be a heathen the rest of my life. <laughs> That's not how it works. You're at the foot of the cross every day, or you should be. Begging him, Lord, make me look like you. Lord, fix my mind, my thoughts. He says that we should not be conformed to this world, to this place. This is perishing. This is vapor. This is passing away. He says, but rather let your mind be transformed and renewed by the washing of the word of God. Who is the word of God? Who is it? Jesus. Jesus. Thank you again. Jesus is the word of God. He is the Word made flesh. So what he's saying is, let your mind be transformed, renewed, washed by the Word. And the Word bleeds for us every day at Mass. Every day at Mass. On that altar in every Catholic church, the Word bleeds for us. And you can put your brain, or you can put your heart, or you can put your flesh, whatever it is that's causing you to sin, on that altar and say, Lord, when the priest, you know when the priest walks from the back of the church to the front of the church? There's a purpose for that. You can offer up these sins that you have on you, these venial sins. You can offer up these pieces of you that are still broken and not made whole. And you can say, Lord, I want to place these pieces of me on the back of your shepherd. As he comes to your altar, I want to offer myself. Mass is an offering. Mass is a what? It's an offering. We are participants. We are participants in the Mass. We are participants. St. Paul says, if only we would suffer with Christ. If only we would what? Suffer. If only we would suffer with Christ, we would also be glorified. We'd also be what? Glorified. glorified. But how many of us voluntarily are like, yeah, let's suffer today? <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> Put me on the list, baby, I'm ready. <laughs> how many of us volunteer for suffering? Right? Like, nobody. <laughs> I don't see any, like, maybe a little baby hand raised back there. Okay, I appreciate that. 30 hour famine. <laughs> What'd you say? 30 hour famine. 30 hour famine. Let me sign me up for some suffering, right? But then what happens when involuntary suffering comes? How do we handle it? Oh, Lord, have mercy. Some people get angry. Some choice words are spoken aloud. Sometimes I don't Right? Stomp around, have a little temper tantrum. Fall into several types of sin on the way. Right? We're not good with suffering. We struggle to suffer. But St. Paul is inviting us to that. And when we come to Mass, we can offer these pieces of ourselves and say, Lord, and you can offer the good things. You can offer your thankfulness to Him for answered prayers. You can offer your faith to Him. Right? Lord, help my unbelief. You can offer your unbelief on that altar. And then, when the time for the consecration comes, and the transubstantiation, and the Lord is there, in all of his, uh, not even before that, when, when he is there on the cross and he is crucified before the resurrection, his blood runs on that altar as a fulfillment of the Old Testament. And so his blood washes over anything that's on that altar. What are you bringing to offer on that altar? Is it the old image of you before you were Catholic and before you followed Christ? Put that on the altar. 
Let his blood wash that clean. And watch when you leave Mass after you've received him and you've already offered that up, watch him heal you. I promise you, try it for a week. Your life will change. He wants us to heal. He wants us to be exactly who he says we are here in the scripture. This is not like a suggestion. It's not a suggestion. This is truth, period. And when we say yes to Jesus, and we say yes to the word made flesh, and we live by his command, he says, I'll know that you love me if you, if you live by my commands. These are not suggestions. It's a fulfillment. It's fulfillment of prophecies, over 300 prophecies fulfilled in the time that Jesus came. In those 33 short years that he was there, really just in those three years. He is a fulfillment of words which are prophetic, which are breathed from the mouth of God in a place we've never seen. The only way we can see the Father is through the Son. So the only way that other humans can see the Father through the Son is to see him through us. Have you guys seen that movie, Paul the Apostle, the newest one that just came out? Yeah, some of you? So there's this scene, and you guys know how brutal the Romans were, right? Like they were just, Lord have mercy, they were awful. And there's this scene where Luke is, who's played by Jim Caviezel, you guys know him? He played fashion, okay. Uh, and there's this scene where he's frustrated, but he can't be frustrated in front of the camp of Christians that are all huddled together, because he kind of has to be like the leader. How many of you have ever had to be like the tough one in your family and you can't, you know, show your emotions because you have to be tough for everybody else? Yeah. So that was Luke's kind of character in this movie, and he was like, yeah, you guys, we... We can't pay them back, you know, eye for an eye, arm for an arm. That's not what Christ wants from us. And he's trying to calm everybody down because they want to revolt against the Romans. But there's not even enough of them to revolt against anything. There's just such a small group of them. And he goes to see St. Paul. And as they're sitting in this, in this prison, he, he can finally be himself. And he can finally express his actual anger towards the Romans. And I relate with this scene so much because when you see injustice, as a Christian, you want to make it right. Right? You want justice to prevail. And so Luke looks at Paul and he starts crying and he's frustrated and angry all at the same time. And he says, I'm so mad at these Romans. Maybe they're right. Maybe we should storm the gates. And we should, we should kill them like they've killed us. And we should take their women like they've taken ours. And we should hurt their children like they've hurt our children. And St. Paul stops him and he says, no. But you see this very raw moment from Luke, this very human moment from Luke. And Paul begins to explain to him the cross. And he begins to explain to him the way of love. And he begins to explain to him who we're called to be as Christians. And the rest of the movie, you watch St. Paul live out the cross. You watch St. Paul, who has his moments, his human moments of like, Doubt, like if you've read, how many of you read your Bible pretty regularly? Kind of. No, okay. So if you read, let's work on that. <laughs> you guys are still young. Amen. So <laughs> uh, Paul begins to go through a lot of what he explains throughout the New Testament. And it's wonderful to see how Paul explains Jesus and how he explained God's power over even circumstances that we think are unjust because God's plan is greater than our understanding. Because we're called to trust God, not understand Him. Amen? We're called to trust God, not understand. Yes. So when circumstances look bleak and you don't really understand what's happening or how to fix it or what you could be doing to make things right, we're called to a deep sense of trust, not to a deep sense of, I understand, I have to run everything, I'm in control, the key word and phrase and all of that is I. That's I-centered. That's not God-centered. Amen? We are called to a deep trust of God. And Mary does that so beautifully, our Blessed Mother. She does that so beautifully. Let it be done unto me according to your word and your will, not my own. Knowing very well what she just signed herself up for. The depth of pain she had to watch and endure. Any just person, when they watch The Passion, I don't know if you're like me, but when I watch The Passion, I start yelling at the TV, telling the soldiers to stop hitting Jesus because he didn't do anything. And things that are like nearby, I just want to chuck him at the TV. It's like the closest I could get to like, stop! Like, leave him alone! Anyone else do that? Or is that just me? Because when I'm watching that movie, I just, it's so real. 
you know? And the passion, my God, it's like, you watch this and you just think, if I was on that road, if I was there, who would I have been? Would I have been Simon? You know, would I have been Peter, wherever Peter was? Would I have been Judas? Who was I? Who, who am I in this? Am I Mary? Mary or Mary? Our life, every time I talk to Father Ogu about things that don't make sense, he always tells me life is a mystery. And I just look at him like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you ever have somebody tell you stuff that you're like, thank you, appreciate that. <laughs> I'll be like crying, my life is falling apart. Life is a mystery, yes it is. <laughs> And then he'll be like, because God is a mystery behind all of me. Right? That makes sense. Anybody have a favorite thing? Who are your favorite things? Hey, Joan Mark. Say John Mark. Who else? John Paul II. JP, yes. Who else? Michael the Archangel. Amen. <laughs> Amen. He's needed. Very much. Who else? Hey, Teresa. Mm. Same Patrick. Yeah, same Nobody, nobody's favorite saint, Saint Nicholas. He's much better Nobody has that in them. Don't lie. He's like, me. Why did I know? <laughs> if Harry was here, he would like me too. I know, I understand. <laughs> yeah. St. Paul is my favorite. St. Paul. Paul has this beautiful way, this beautiful way, this beautiful balance. You know, at one point in his life he says, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Isn't that the goal of our identity? That's the source and summit of who we are. That Christ would live in us and people would see us and say, hey, that's Jesus. Well, that's a follower of Jesus. And I say it the first way because St. Luke, in this film that I'm telling you about, when Paul was having doubts, St. Paul was having doubts and he was telling Luke, you know, maybe we shouldn't, I, I don't know, maybe we shouldn't write all the things that I've said because I don't want people to follow me, I want them to follow Jesus. What's that called? Humility. He said, I don't want people to follow me, I want them to follow Jesus. And St. Luke says, no, listen to me. He says something really important, he says, listen to me. I never met Jesus. I never sat with him. I never felt who he is in my presence. I never got to look at him in all of his splendor and glory, but you did. He knocked you down and he spoke to your heart and he converted you. And he removed your pride and he worked on your heart and he taught you how to love and how to speak. You, when I hear you speak and when you preach the gospel, Paul, I see Christ in you. I see Christ in you. That's what people should say about us. We are disciples. We are what? Disciples. We are disciples. You know, people ask me, like, sometimes I'm in a secular place like the gym. <laughs> gym is a real secular place, amen? There's all kinds of things going on in the gym. And I'm in the sauna, you know, women are cackling in the sauna. I don't know why people can't just sit silently in the sauna. They're just cackling about in the sauna. And they'll be like, oh my gosh, like, what's your sign? And I'm like, I'm sorry? I'm like, what? I'm like, what's your sign? And you're like, Scorpio, or like, Capricorn, and I'm like, Christian. <laughs> We're in the world, not of it. Amen? People should see us, and when they hear us, when we're speaking, they should be saying what St. Luke was saying to Paul. Those same words. When I saw how you treated that woman the other day, when I saw how you helped the elderly, when I saw how you took care of your sick father, when I saw how you were honest at school when everyone was lying, my God, I saw Christ in you. I saw Christ in you. I saw something so different. I saw something so unselfish. I saw someone that was not of this earth. I saw someone with a morale and a compass that was different than everybody else, amen? That's what people should be saying about us. My God, when I saw you, I saw Christ in you. Self-worth is found in Christ. Dignity is found in Christ. 
understanding of who we're called to be is found in Christ. We're not going to find it asking other people what they think of us. I've tried that. It doesn't work. Everybody has a different opinion. I could ask the three of you, and you can tell me three different things. Well, how confusing is that? People always have something to say, right? People always have something to complain about, something they don't like, something they do like. But we can't live on the praise or the criticism of humans. That can't be what dictates who we are. It changes like the wind. And plus, there's something called idolatry. How many know what idolatry is? What's idolatry? Uh, do you have something other than God more important in your life? Amen. Did you hear what he said? No. To give something or someone other than God more importance in your life. So let's say I have a throne here. Throne. Okay. And, I don't know, someone tells me something about myself, like, oh my gosh, you're seriously so pretty, and like, I don't know, you're my idol, like, I love you so much. And that comment comes and sits on the throne of my life. I'm so pretty, I'm their idol, and they love me so much. And now I walk around thinking, I'm so pretty, I'm everyone's idol, and everyone loves me so much. I'm basically perfect. Or the opposite. Gosh, you're so ugly and you're so stupid. And honestly, I hate your feet. Well, let's say those comments come and sit on the throne of my life. So now I walk around. Gosh, I'm so ugly. Stupid. Feet are ugly. Right? Right? We laugh. That's true. We do this. And now we've made people's opinions an idol. Because now we're living by someone else's word on our, on our life and their opinion on our life versus who he calls us to be in Christ. Am I making sense to you? Those are two very different paths. One is saying I value people's words, people's opinion, people's praise, people's doubt versus God's word, God's love, and God's creation of me in Christ. Those are two very different ways to live your life. You get an F on a test, does that define you? No. No. You get dumped by somebody, does it define you? Does it? You guys got really quiet on that one. <laughs> That's a tough one, right? Because someone else's rejection of you can turn into your rejection of yourself. Am I making sense? Yeah. And that's the last thing God wants. God's relationship with us is not about him rejecting us. It's about him loving us so gigantically much that he sends himself here for us to do the one thing we can't do for ourselves because we're sinners. The greatest saint is still a sinner. We can't save ourselves. I've tried it. I've tried it. Read through the Bible, write out all the things. Law one, don't mix fabrics. Law two, sacrifice on the altar. Law three, Guarantee you there's going to be one you can't do. Guarantee you. We can't keep the law. It's, it's impossible for us. So he said, I came to fulfill that law. Because you guys got so wrapped up in trying to make your checklist to do the right thing versus changing your hearts. How many times does he call the Israelites stiff-necked, hard-hearted people? How many times does he say that in the Bible? Over and over. It was because of the hardness of your heart. It was because your necks were stiff. That's why this didn't pan out. That's why I allowed this. That's why this happened. He's trying to tell us, I want your neck to turn when I say turn. When I say go. When I say serve. When I say love. I want your heart to beat. And I want your heart to hurt. And I want your heart to feel as mine does on the cross when I said, I thirst. He didn't want water. He wasn't looking for a Pepsi. Or some Kool-Aid? He wasn't parched and sweaty and hot. He wanted love. I thirst for a people who would love me, who would suffer with me. Christ says I make up for the sufferings of Christ. It's not that Christ's suffering is insufficient. It's that we are so sinful on this earth that even though Christ did all that, he says pick up your cross and follow me. I want to see if you know how to love. I want to see if you know how to sacrifice. Can you follow me? Can you handle the cross I've given you? 
And if not, will you ask for my help? Will you ask for my help? Will you say, Lord, this is too heavy. Be with me. Lord, I'm not sure what to do. Give me wisdom. Help me to discern what you're asking of me. Would you plead with him? You know, St. Francis of Assisi would sit in the church. I thought about doing this one day because I think I'm a Franciscan at heart, discerning third order. I'm not really sure. But anyways, he was sitting, he would sit in front of the tabernacle, and then like the church would like close, you know, for the night, because at nighttime they close the church. And they, they would close the church at night, and he would just leave me here. And he would just stay there with Jesus all night. And he said when Brother Son would come out, he'd get really mad. Because Brother Son was interrupting the evening that he was having with Jesus and the conversations he was having with Christ in the tabernacle. He was sitting there all night long talking to, to Jesus in the tabernacle. And he was upset when the sun would come out. That's the type of soft, beautiful, open, vulnerable hearted people he's calling us to be. Not pushovers. He's saying, know me. Love me, serve me, commune with me, talk to me, that I may guard and guide your path. How can we serve him if we don't know him? How can we love if we don't know him? That's a selfish love. Our love is selfish, flat out selfish. If given the choice between doing something for yourself and doing something for someone else, I guarantee you're going to think twice about it. Give them the donut. Or, <laughs> you can take one for later. Right? Tell me these aren't your thoughts. Apply any other thing you want to that example. I use donuts because it's you know, the biggest ministry we have at this parish. So, <laughs> <laughs> Most important ministry at any church. The donut ministry. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how many people come. Just in all. He's calling us to this beautiful, radical love. And it's so different from what the world calls love today. People say, oh my gosh, I love those sunglasses. They're so cute. You love the sunglasses? <laughs> like we use the word love for everything, right? Like, I love you. You met me three seconds ago. Like, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I've met people in this parish who literally would come to me, oh my gosh, you read all the time? I seriously love you. And I'm like, you love Jesus. You don't even know me. <laughs> like, I, we've never even, like, we just throw the word love around, and Christ is calling us to this very deep understanding of the word love. Love looks like the cross, and we throw the word love around. I love donuts. I love popcorn. Oh my gosh, I love when we all hang out. It's amazing. But do you know how to actually love? What happens when sacrifice comes in? See, love is our identity in Christ. If we love well, we look like Christ, and our heart is conformed to that love. And thus we are whole. We're what? Oh, how many of you want peace and wholeness? Yeah, yeah, this, this generation is riddled with anxiety, fear, depression, and none of those are of God. None of them are of God. I do this enough to know that when I sit with women and I sit with men and I sit with college students and I sit with high school students and middle school students, what does a 12-year-old know about anxiety? What, what is it, what is it? When I was 12, I was wearing overalls and sweating because I was running around chasing some little boy named Brian through a field. <laughs> That's what I was doing when I was 12, right? In this generation, 12-year-olds are suicidal and they're anxious. I didn't even know what anxiety was when I was 12. I had never even experienced the feeling of that type of fear and stress. And when I asked them, what are you anxious about? I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. You're 12. You're a kid. Go run outside. Feel the wind in your hair. Right? And then they send them to all these counselors and all these doctors, and they come back and they tell me, Miss Diana, I went to the doctor and they gave me all these pills. I'm like, why are you on so many pills? You're 12 years old. When I was 12, I had big poofy hair. That was my biggest stress. <laughs> so, like, I wanted straight hair, like, all my friends. Like, I had such, like, trivial concerns when I was 12. Anyone else, like, my concerns were super trivial when I was 12, right? And I meet 12-year-olds today, and I just think, my God. How many of you know middle school kids right now? You know what I'm talking about, right? You've met them, you've talked to them. Yeah. Why, though? It's because we've lost connection with Christ. We've lost connection with our beloved. He's who gives us purpose, joy, identity. That's, that's who gives that to us. 
You see, happiness is fleeting. Happiness is an emotion. It's a feeling. Happiness is what? Yeah, all of those things. Joy is what we're after. Because joy is lasting and it's rooted in Christ. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's a spiritual gift to be joyous. Which means, when St. Paul was being taken out, dragged out by Nero and his weirdos to be beheaded, he wasn't screaming and saying, let me go, you've got the wrong guy, I'm not the one, I didn't do anything. St. Paul wasn't asking them to release him. He was like, this is the will of God. You think I didn't come here by my own will? You think I didn't say your will be done? You think I didn't look up to the heavens like Christ did and say, whatever your will is, be it done unto me. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And if this is what I'm going to do, if this is the suffering I'm going to live through, then may God be glorified. If only we'd suffer with Christ, we'd be glorified with him. We don't talk about the correct type of suffering in our generation. Hardly ever, right? People tell you, oh, do whatever makes you feel good. Be happy. Chase your happiness and chase your dreams, kids. But nobody tells you what that looks like for a Christian. For a Christian, it's a totally different path. It's totally different. It's not chase your dreams. It's chase the cross. It's submit to the will of God. It's say, take my will and make it yours. Take my heart and make it yours. Take this mind and renew it. That I would think as you think and see as you see. I want to hear how you hear. Come live in me. Reside in me. I don't just receive you in the Eucharist and go about my life, the old heathen that I've always been. I receive the Eucharist and I ask you to move in me. Amen? Amen. That's who we are as Catholics. And I really believe he's calling this generation to something so beautiful. There's a lot of people in your guys' generation who are orthodox and chasing the cross at whatever cost. At the cost of being rejected by your families, maybe you've already been rejected by your families, to follow Jesus. That is the example he's calling us to. It's a radical love. It's a radical change. Is it easy? No. Was it meant to be? No. Never. Never. But grace is sufficient. Amen? Grace is sufficient. He provides. He equips. He encourages. He lifts us. When the saints went joyfully to wherever they were headed, whether it was, have you guys read the story of St. Perpetua? Or Felicity? Oh my gosh, you guys. I need to like, <laughs> we need to have like, we need to have like a, a month session and every Monday I'll come in with readings for y'all. Their, I mean, their stories are incredible. These are saints that still to this day, the priest, when he's on the altar, and he's mentioning all these saints, you hear him say, Saints Felicity and Saints Perpetua. You, those names sound familiar to you? At almost every single Mass, you'll hear them, them say these names. And there's a reason for that. It's because right around like the 3rd century AD, or like close in that respect, it was very, very soon after Christ, there were these two women who loved Christ so much that they were willing to go through actual hell. Actual hell. Beaten alive by animals in front of a crowd that's screaming and joy and happiness that they were going to be eaten alive. And these women, as this was about to happen, Christ came in the Holy Spirit and showed these women the glory of heaven. And so as these horrendous acts were happening to them, so if we were sitting in the audience, we'd be seeing horrendous acts. We'd be thinking, oh my gosh, these people are savages and animals. We should shoot them all. They're absolutely terrible people. Like, we would just want justice for these women. And what's actually happening to these women is that the glory of heaven is open before them. They see a staircase taking them up to heaven. Actually, St. Perpetua didn't even feel the pain of what was happening to her. At the very end, she felt it. But the entire time it was happening, all she could see and experience was this ecstasy of being lifted into heaven with Christ. If only we would suffer with Christ, we'd be glorified with him. These are women. These aren't like valiant men on horses with armor. They're like women who just had babies. Like one of them had a baby. One of them was pregnant. Felicity was pregnant. And Perpetua had just had a baby. Just had a baby. Can you imagine the type of sacrifice these women were willing to make for Jesus? Saints. These women are saints. And there's so many men saints who have done the same thing. Consistently said yes to the cross. 
and the grace to do it was there. Every time I tell my friend Jen, you guys know my friend Jen, right? You see her with me all the time, she looks like a nun. <laughs> they think we're both nuns, it's hilarious, we're not. And you know, right? But, <clears throat> one day, who knows? But when, when I tell her, like, oh man, I, I got called to, I just, I went to Biloxi, Mississippi just last month to give a talk, and I was telling her, like, man, I'm gonna fly by myself, I usually have my crew with me, I got my film guys with me, I normally have like, a team, and I was like, but I'm going alone this time, and I'm super scared to go by myself, it's like a super long flight, I'm gonna stay by myself, and who knows if people are gonna be nice when I get there, and she told me, Dad, the grace to do what God's calling you to do is not gonna show up until you start moving in that direction. So you can sit at home and worry all you want, but the second you get on that flight, grace will be there. The second you get off that flight, grace will be there. Grace will meet you where you're at. That's exactly what happened. Grace met me every step of the way. And that's what happened to the saints. Why do you think they weren't screaming when all this stuff was happening to them? It's because grace met them where they were. And that's the type of holy courage we should carry in our identity as Christians. You know, you said your favorite saint is Saint Joan of Arc. What a brave young woman. Grace met her where she was. St. Peter, St. Paul, Grace met them where they were. How do you want Grace to meet you where you are? How many of you are willing to step out? It's scary, I know. So what I want to do, um, I want to go through some of these. Obviously I don't know who wrote them, which is great. And then I want to do a Q&A, so if you have any questions, hang tight, because we're going to do this. This one's really tightly folded up. No one, ever. So what was the first question I asked you? Do you like yourself? I'm just going to grab a couple and see what we have here. Do you like yourself? We have a yes, a yes, and a no. Do you love yourself was my second question. And we have more no's than yeses. Same thing. Two yeses. Yes and a no. Why do you think it's harder to love ourselves than it is to like ourselves? Why is that harder? A lot of you answered, yes, I like myself, but no, I don't love myself. Why? It's hard. But it shouldn't be. You're made in the image and likeness of God. So I have one final question to ask you before you ask me questions. If you don't love yourself and you're made in the image and likeness of God, do you love God? You say yes. But if you're actually his image and his likeness and your answer is no, do you love God? I asked myself this question in Mass, in front of Jesus. You know what he reminded me of? He said, Diana Weeby, you don't trust me. So how can you love me? You don't trust me. You want to be in control of your life. You want to fix things so that they're perfect and they work out the way you want them to so that you don't have to worry about anything. But is that trust or control? That's control. I want to challenge you guys to be really honest before Christ. You're not talking, if you want to talk to someone about it, you're more than welcome to. 
But before Jesus, before the tabernacle, before the Eucharist, in adoration, be brutally honest about who you are. Ask yourself the hard questions. Because it's only then that he's going to enter in here and start sweeping up the dust and saying, this doesn't belong here, this doesn't belong here, this thought doesn't belong here, this music doesn't belong here, it's messing with your head, this is messing with who you think you are. He's going to start sweeping up and cleaning house. That's what he does. He's real good at that. He's a healer, remember? He came for the sick because they need a physician. That's us, y'all. That's not those people over there. That's not the heathens at your college. That's us. It's them too if they want him to be. That's us. We're all sick in some way. We're all in need of healing in some way. Why? Because we're sinners. The wages of sin are death. What brings death? Sickness. We need him. And I have found that sitting there, and it's so cool that it's in this church and I'm giving this talk in this church because I can't tell you how much healing has come in that church, right in front of that tabernacle, during these masses. Like if I was giving this talk somewhere else, I'd be like, oh my gosh, is this church in Riverside? I stick up on the tabernacle, it's really cool, let me tell you about it, it's stained glass windows and the whole thing. But it's like it's here, I can tell you, it's literally right there, where a lot of my healing has come from. It's not some far distant place, it's right here, where heaven opens up, and Christ comes in and does the work on my heart and my mind that he needs to, that I need him to. So you promise me that you'll be honest with yourself? This is not looking good. <laughs> Can you? Good. You're worth it. You believe that? You're worth it. Look at the crucifix and say, I'm worth it. I'm worth it. I'm worth changing. I'm worth healing. Amen? Amen. So um, I'd like to open this up for some Q&A. And I don't really want to put anything specific on the table. Like if you guys have life questions, <laughs> ask them. Um, as weird as they are, ask them. I'm going to answer you with like 100% honesty. How did you start and how did you know when to start? Um, like for healing? Yeah. Um, about a year and a half ago, I got married, and my husband left me after four months. And that type of rejection breaks a person. Amen? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I started searching real hard. And I started asking Christ, who am I? What am I supposed to look like? Because I can't see right now. I can't see who I'm supposed to be. All I see is pain and suffering, and I can't see anything through a lens that looks remotely Christian. It was dark, and I didn't understand a whole lot of my life. And I said, I need your help. And I want healing, and I want to change whatever it is in me that you want to change. And I don't want to live under this cloud of rejection ever again. I want to be who you made me to be, regardless of what anyone says or thinks, I want to be rooted in who you are. And I want to be able to show mercy to those who reject me and who hurt me. And I want to be able to live in a place of freedom. And in order to do that, you have to heal. Freedom can't come when you're in bondage to whatever someone has done to you, said to you, no matter how wrong they were. You're attached to that if you allow yourself to be attached to that. But when you allow Christ to come into it, Forgiveness comes in, and then freedom enters, and then you change, and then you change. And you're able to offer love and forgiveness even when people don't deserve it. When you'd rather smack them or, you know, run away or say hurtful things back to them to feel better about yourself. No. No. There's a better way. There's a a more joyous way, there's a way to heal, and there's a way to carry your cross in the midst of suffering like that. So if you've been through something similar, or a type of rejection or abandonment like that, let him heal you, because you're worth it. You can't be who he's asking you to be, you can't serve how he's asking you to serve, if you're always wounded. 
You can serve as a servant from a wounded place, but you have to heal from those wounds. You can use them as an example of his glory and his goodness and what he's done for you, but healing has to come. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's a good question. Thank you for asking. All right. Well, yes. So, I'm very interested in What would you like to be the patron saint of? Um, man. Uh, I thought about this before. It's a tough one. Because then I just like, you have to think about it. If, that, if you're the patron saint of that, that means for the eternity. Right? <laughs> that means for eternity, you're going to have to hear those same prayers over and over again. Because that's what you do. It's like if you're the patron saint of like anxious people, right? Like you'd be hearing all those anxious prayers all the time. So I'm like, mm, like something I want to be the patron saint of, but then there's other things that I'm like, I don't know if I want to hear that all the time. I don't know. I would say anxious people because I feel like I've really been delivered from that. And I want to help people heal from that because it's not it's not okay and it's not of God. And it's terrible and awful and miserable and no one should live like that. Um, but then I also want to say like people afraid of their calling, like people afraid of their giftings. Because I was for the longest time, I ran from them. I was like, let me just be normal. Whatever that is. Like no one's normal. Like, right? Like if I sit and talk to you, you're probably super weird. Like, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> that is also true. I do know that you are actually super weird. <laughs> like, like if I talk to anybody, I'm like, they're not normal. Like everyone has this like beautiful uniqueness to them, which makes them a little weird, a little off. So I kind of want to be the patron saint of like running from falling. And I want to help people stay. <laughs> you guys should laugh because it's true. We're all a little, you know, nobody's like right there. <laughs> We're a little off. So yeah, that's a good question. Yeah? <laughs> All right. So, well, off of my own assumption, I'm assuming you, like, prepared this talk for, like, for, well, with the idea that we all come to church already, like, we're already, like, we're, we're in. Uh, how would you have prepared differently, or, like, what would you have say, said if it was, like, to everyone on campus? I don't know. I actually don't have any, I don't have anything prepared. This is this is empty. Oh. I opened my Bible to the, the first chapter of Genesis, but I already have it in my heart. It's already memorized. I actually didn't even need my Bible. Half the time I bring my Bible, and I spend so much time reading Scripture on a regular basis that exactly what he says here, that my word would be written on their heart, that's what's happened to me. Like, I'll say words, and I'm like, how did I even know that verse? Holy Spirit. I don't have an explanation for that. I don't know it. Right? I don't prepare either. Nothing. There's nothing. There's nothing. There's nothing here. I don't prepare my talks. I think about stuff that I would like to say, but then half the time I come in and that's not what I end up saying at all. And then I read half the time I have them record these videos so I can learn from them. Because he's talking, not me. So then I go, well, amen, let me take notes. <laughs> right? My team always laughs. Like, my team that comes, they always laugh. They're like, dude, when you said this, I'm like, I said that? Yeah, like, and that's what I'm saying. Where you're gifted, that's where the grace is going to be. And I tried to hide this gift from myself and from others for the longest time. I was like, I'm not going to be an evangelist. It's too hard. The weight is too heavy. There's too many people. They have too many problems. I can't do that. And I ran from it forever. But broken people and, like, unbelievers, they're some of my favorite people to minister to. It's great. It's great. At my event this weekend, there was a girl who wasn't sure if she was Protestant or Catholic, and she was kind of bouncing around at different churches, and she wasn't really sure what her faith was, but she was just so happy to be in that space and just to hear and to learn and to grow, and, you know, God's mercy is so big. So big. When you're looking into people's eyes, like, one at a time, it's, like, incredible. It's so incredible. And, like, I pray for you guys that whatever your gifts are, whatever your charisms are, however God has blessed you, and anointed you to serve in this generation, I pray that you would do it. And I pray that you just ask for holy courage to do it and not try to bury your talents and bury your gifts because guess what we need you? I need you. The world needs you. And that may sound cliche, but it's so true. You weren't created unpurposely and unintentionally. You were made in the image and likeness of God. Genesis chapter 1. Truthfully, that's who you are. So whatever he's calling you to do, whoever he's calling you to be, be that, do that. 
and stop trying to hide it or pretend to be humble by hiding it. That's not humility. That's a denial of God's grace working in you. That's a burying of your talents. Humility is saying your will be done, not mine. So when I don't feel like doing this, and there's a lot of times I don't feel like doing this, that's my offering. I don't feel like dealing with problems from people. I don't feel like suffering for them before I come give a talk. I don't feel like feeling like someone in the crowd, like he'll, he'll allow me to experience the type of suffering someone has in the room before I come give a talk. I don't feel like going through that sometimes, most of the time, all the time. That's part of our offering to him. So it would be different. At every place I go, it's different. I have no idea. So I'll probably rewatch this for sure <laughs> and learn about my own dignity. <laughs> Thank you for having me.